before I start, uh, we were debating yesterday after, after seeing all the cool graphics, uh, the graphic recordings, how long we need to stay on this slide in order for the butterfly to appear there. Uh, so I'll try to take as much time as possible. Um, so first of all, it's not a butterfly, it's a moss and more specifically a Luna moss. Uh, we track a threat, threat group by this name, Luna moss. Um, and what we want to share with you today is a case study of how we took IOCs that we discovered uh, by responding to incidents um, and through the process of pivoting, how we uncovered and unraveled their infrastructure. Um, in our talk, we'll have three main parts. Uh, we'll give you a bit of background on this group um, and their go-to technique that they use in order to infiltrate networks. Next, we'll share two pivoting examples that we used in order to track this group. And of course, we'll wrap it up with some insights. Before we start, a bit about ourselves. Uh, I'm Noam. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am an incident responder at Signia. I've been with Signia for three years almost, uh, tomorrow, actually. Um, and I come from an ex-military background, so yeah, that's about it. Uh, hi, nice to meet you all. I'm Oren. For the past three years, I've been working as a senior IR expert at Signia. I'm a bookworm, a foodie, and a coffee lover. Let's start. So we all get phishing messages all the time, right? You know, the message from the prince that really needs our help. And if we would just help him now, he would make us rich one day. But there are different types of phishing emails out there. Take this email message, for example. If we carefully read the email, we can see that it's not from the prince, it's from a well-known service, it's from masterclass. And there are no typos in the email, no links. There is a PDF attachment, but it's not malicious at all. If we click and open the PDF, we can see there a receipt for one of Gordon Ramsay's cooking classes. As a foodie, I would love to attend this class. But if you don't want Gordon Ramsay to yell at you, you can just call the number at the bottom of the email and cancel the subscription. Since there is nothing malicious about this email message, anti-spam solutions won't flag or block it. But this email is in fact the first stage of an attack called callback phishing. Callback phishing is an initial access attack vector, heavily reliant on social engineering. It's comprised of three stages. First, a phishing email, like the message we just saw. Second, a phone call, which the victim initiates. And third, some sort of software deployment. The email messages originate from free email services. The emails do themselves do not contain any links. And while some of them have an attachment, it is not weaponized in any way. The emails mimic well-known brands like Masterclass or Duolingo, and they inform the victim about an upcoming charge due to a service or subscription that they purchased. If the victim wants to cancel the charge, they can just call the call center and a human operator will answer the call and will manipulate them into downloading some sort of Trojan. The Trojan will be later used by the threat actor to gain hands-on keyboard access to the compromised host. Uh, and depending on the group conducting this activity, it can lead to data exfiltration, ransomware deployment, and quick compromise of an entire network. How is this all connected to Lunamoth? Well, Lunamoth is a group that specializes in callback phishing. Based on a research conducted by Advanced Intel, Lunamoth were originally part of the Ryuk Conti operation. Back then in 2020, um, Lunamot had a different flow. The call center operator would try to trick the user into downloading a weaponized office document. When the user enabled macros, bazaar loader will be executed on the endpoint, ultimately leading to ransomware deployment. Following the Russo-Ukraine war, Conti disintegrated into several groups and Lunamot emerged as an independent group in March of 2022. In their 
post-country reincarnation, the group is not yet another ransomware group. They, their technique is a bit different since they do not use malware, they don't encrypt files, and they do not maintain a leak site. Lunamot's avoidance for malware, combined with their highly reliance on, on social engineering, means that technology alone is not enough to stop this threat. What can stop them? Good threat intelligence. Awesome. So I want to finish this background on Lunamoth by sharing with you what a Lunamoth attack flow looks like. It all starts just as we've explained with a phishing email um, containing a receipt for a purchased service, let's say a Duolingo service. Um, the phishing email contains a US no a phone number and the victim calls the phone number. On the other side sits the operator who leads the victim to installing remote administration tools on their device, right? These are not malicious tools by nature, but they are used maliciously by Lunamon. Now, just to, to be able to get you the feel of how they work, these operators, during an investigation that we conducted, we found out that the victim who was on the call with this operator uh, was instructed to install these tools on their device. However, they didn't have the permissions to install these tools on the device. So the operator uh, led the victim to open a ticket with IT in order to install these tools on their device. It's a very bold move, but they got initial access. So they have these tools on the first device um, and they use these tools uh, for the next phases of the attack. They deploy additional tools such as Arclone and, and SharpShares and many others in order to explore the network uh, locate sensitive files and information, and exfiltrate them outside. Once they believe that they have enough information on their hand, they turn to the final phase, which is extortion. Uh, they send out a, a ransom demand to the organization, demanding a large sum of money um, while holding the sensitive data hostage. Right? So just to reiterate, we're talking about short breaches, very focused on the... The, the location and locating information and stealing it, and then moving on to the extortion. So this summarizes our background. At this point, we have these IOCs, and we want to start to find additional IOCs. We want to understand this attacker's infrastructure. Um, naturally, we turn to pivoting, as you can see. Um, and uh, so let, let's start pivoting. Great. So two years ago at Sun CTI Summit, Joe Slovic shared with us this amazing visualization of how to pivot on network infrastructure. So the method takes each one of the indicator, domain, IP, certificate, and breaks them down into their building blocks, into small observable. So if we want to pivot on domain name, we can, for example, pivot on registrar or registrant. If we want to pivot on IP address, we can, for example, pivot on hosting provider, hosting location, or on the JAM hash. A quick refresher, JAM is an active TLS server fingerprinting tool. It's a very useful tool to cluster servers together. Now, I know this is highly theoretical. In practice, it all comes down to an Excel spreadsheet. And this is a snippet from our Excel spreadsheet. Don't bother reading the information in the table. It's not as important as the method. So we first encountered Lunamot doing IR engagement. And during the investigation phase, we collected all the indicators of compromise, and then we wanted to pivot. So we took the IOCs, broke them down into their observables, and put the data into the table. Since pivoting is an iterative process, each new indicator that was discovered, was broken down and inserted into the table. Analyzing the data in the table, clear patterns were starting to emerge. All the phishing domains shared a naming theme. It was the name of a known service like Zoho or Masterclass with a word appended to it. Okay, so Masterclass Cooking, Zoho Teaching Master, Duolingo Class. The top level domain was either .com or Dot .xyz, and there was no subdomain. All the domains were registered under Namecheap, 
uh, doing 2022 in a short time span before the actual campaign started. Analyzing the IP address information, we noticed that all the domains were hosted under HostWind and they share the specific jam hash. At first, when we started to pivot, the jam hash looked promising, but we quickly realized it yields far too many results. Turn, turns out that the jam fingerprint we used actually fingerprints a clean installation of Apache web server on Ubuntu. And clearly Lunamod does not own all Apache web servers on Ubuntu. So we decided to combine the jam hash with the hosting provider, and we got fewer results. To filter out additional false positives, we added the top level domain. This allowed us to create a very strong signature that helped us identify the entire Lunamot infrastructure. Additional IR engagements that we conducted help us confirm and validate our signature. And, and I can tell you, it feels great when the signature you created works and identifies attackers in the real world. Okay, cool. Um, so we have this signature on the infrastructure. At this, at this point of time, we were starting to look for another key element that we can use in order to pivot on this attack. We decided to deep dive into the PDF files that are sent out as part of the phishing scenarios. And that's because uh, we, you can see them in all of the different Lunamoth attacks. It's the first stage of the attack. Now, the methodology behind pivoting on PDF files is not that different. We just take the samples and break them down into different building blocks. Let's say, for example, the PDF version, the creator, the producer, the amount of uh, pages the file has, um, all these different characteristics we, which we can use and work with in order to pivot on these files. Now, before we start, it is important to understand our viewpoint into the landscape. Um, and as incident responders, our viewpoint is or are the incidents that we respond to. And on top of those, we add the layer of engines such as VirusTotal uh, and many others in order to widen and broaden our pipeline as much as possible. Okay, so we start with the complete universe of PDF files that we have in our pipeline. The first characteristic that we decided to look at um, touches to the process in which these PDF files are created. Uh, we often like to look at these, uh, uh, the, the way the files are created because uh, in many cases, when attackers uh, send out mass amounts of files, they often have some sort of automated way or process of creating these files. With Lunamoth, they use a tool called WKHTML to PDF. Um, and by using this tool, it also adds certain information to all of the different PDFs that they send out. And you can see on the snippet to the right, uh, we have the PDF version, we have the creator and producer tags that are added to all of the files that they send out. So this is a good starting point, right? We can use this information. We can take it in order to start pivoting. But Lunamoth are not the only ones who are using this tool which means it's not, a, it's not a signature yet, right? However, it did take us a step forward, right? We started with the whole universe of PDF files and we started narrowing it down to a smaller subset of files. So next, we started looking at the file structure. We're talking about receipts, about uh, some kind of payment. Um, and all of the samples that we had only had one page. And we can use this information, right? We can filter out anything that has more than one page, right? At this point, we wanted to look at another layer. We calculated the average file sizes, of all the samples that we had. We found out that when we limit the signature to look at files that range between 30 and 50 kilobytes in size, we were left with a subset of files that were all related to Lunamoth campaigns. Now, that's amazing, by the way. Now, uh, theoretically, if that was not enough, we could also add another layer to the process, right? Let's say, for example, uh, looking at the file contents itself, we know this is a subscription related um, a receipt, right? So we can look for any keywords that might be found in these files. In this case, we didn't add this layer, but of course we could if it, if it was needed. So we started with the 
whole universe of PDF files in our pipeline. And we ended with a subset of files that were all related to Lunamoth campaign, which means we have another signature, right? So we have the first signature on the domains and infrastructure. We have this second signature on the PDF files. And then the question to you guys is what's next? Naturally, because we want to track this group, we turn to automating the process of using these signatures. Um, so you can see on the right, uh, this uh, alert of the, that popped up as part of this uh, automation process. Uh, it's showing two new domains that Lunamoth registered uh, back in June. Uh, one is related to a, a masterclass campaign, the other to a Duolingo campaign, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we have some sort of automated process that's popping up new domains that we think are related to Lunamoth, uh, potentially, of course. Um, another angle that these two signatures helped us uh, with is to determine the start, start, starting point in time of, of Lunamoth's operation. And that dated back to March of 2022. Right, the, the first samples that we saw, the first domains that we saw them register. Um, a couple months after we, we reached this conclusion uh, and, and published it in our blog post, uh, we also saw uh, Advanced Intel uh, release uh, a nice uh, paper on, on this group where they reached that same conclusion. And it's always nice to see other fellow researchers reach these same, same conclusions about these groups. Now, one thing about automation uh, that we really, really want to share with you is that in practice, many times automation doesn't, doesn't go as, as neat as we want it to, right? Sometimes we have false positives. Now the new alert you can see on screen shows three different domains. Um, two of these domains are actually really related to Lunama, but the one in the middle is not connected at all, right? It's, it's a false positive. So since we want to create threat intelligence or actionable threat intelligence in the form of domains that we can block, and we don't want to block legitimate domains. Um, this is a problem, right? We, we can't just use this information and, and stream it. Um, so what we decided to do with this problem is use two different layers to our process of automation. The first layer of automation uses a more per permissive signature. And this is exactly what you see right now on the screen. It allows these false positives. Right. However, and more importantly, it allows us to determine the new campaign themes as they emerge. And by knowing these new themes as they emerge, we can actually use it and apply it to the second layer of automation to filter out or actually filter in only domains that are related to these new themes. So we have an automated way to find new domains find new PDF samples. Um, we know they're related. There's a connection between the PDF files to these domains. So we have some sort of validation that we're on the right track, uh, which is exactly what we were aiming at. We also took the signature on the uh, uh, PDF files uh, and applied it and across time, a uh, bunch of different uh, samples popped up. You can see uh, a few of them on screen. Um, one thing to note about all these uh, samples is that they all share a certain footer. They all say secured with SSL. And of course, we know that if it says secured with SSL, the actual vendor sent it, right? Of course. Yes. <laughs> so taking all the information created by the automation process and putting it into a graph allowed us to uh, analyze past LunaMod campaigns and continue tracking the group. It also allowed us to identify patterns at the macro level. So if we go back to the beginning of Lunamot's activity, we can see that uh, in April and May, they would run multiple campaigns simultaneously. For example, for Masterclass uh, subscription scam and Duolingo. At July, all their campaigns suddenly stopped. This is when Signia published our blog post on the group. And we would like to believe that we have the power to stop such a thing. After a month of silence, the group returned, they resumed their activity, but this time their technique was a bit different. So instead of running multiple campaigns simultaneously, they would switch campaigns approximately each month. So 
from class pass to Philo to Babel to Curiosity. Although the, the different campaigns use different teams, our signature was still valid because they did not change their TTPs. So we were able to track the group's activity for almost a year. We are still tracking them and we're waiting to see what fishing team they have next for us. Okay, cool. So I see the timer there and we, we need to start wrapping things up. Um, we talked about Luna Month. We talked about callback phishing. We understand this technique. Um, through this case study, we wanted to show you our process, our thought process, step-by-step step of how we took these IOCs, how we broke them down, and through this process of pivoting, created these signatures to track this group. To do this, we first needed to understand our viewpoint into the landscape and widen it as much as possible. And then by working through a structured line of thought, we're able to connect all the different dots and uncover this infrastructure. Attackers and even the most sophisticated ones are often leave ways we can use to track their infrastructure. Now, we talked a lot about Lunamos and this type of family of, of threats uh, that focus on, on the human factor, right? Um, these might not be the most technologically sophisticated threats, uh, but as such, they often sometimes over, overcome the security stack that we have, right? Now, in order to tackle and, and bridge this gap, we, we turn to threat intelligence to be able to create actionable threat intelligence in the form of uh, IOCs that we can block even before we see them being used in breaches. Another angle to this threat intelligence that we, we took is that we provided this information um, to authorities and worked with them in order to track this group while they were running their operation. Of course, you can learn a lot about a group when you track them while they're running their operation. So we shared with you the research that we conducted and the two signatures that we created. Our goal was to show you how you can take separated, isolated IOCs and create a strong signature. The method that we used was to take the indicators of compromise and break them down into their building blocks, into small observables. And then we started pivoting on these observables. The, the problem or the challenge that you have when you pivot on such small indicators that you are likely to get a lot of results. For example, the jam hash that we started with returned nearly half a million results. And this makes you think that you are not on the right path. But when we started to combine the different observables together, we were able to refine our signature by, by layering the different building blocks on top of each other. We, we were able to create a very robust signature that allowed us to create, that allowed us to track the group over a long period of time and multiple campaigns. So the next time that you get half a million results, remember that you might just be on the right path. Thank you very much.